Take out your Bibles, please, and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. The Gospel of John, chapter 4. On a really hot day, like when it's about 90 degrees, and you've been working outside, and you're sweating up a storm, well, the best thing you can do is you go in the house and you, you get yourself a nice tall glass, and you go to the refrigerator and you, you get some ice cubes and you put it in that glass and you get some water and you pour it in there and you drink her on down to quench your thirst. Well, in this passage here, the Lord's going to tell you how to quench your spiritual thirst. There's nothing better that you can do here than drink of the water He's going to give you. John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now a woman of Samaria came to, the, to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him for a drink, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is very deep. Where then will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, who drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of the water of this well will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Then the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I might not thirst, nor ever have to come here again to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have said well, I have no husband, for you have had but five husbands, and the one whom you are now living with is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. Then the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you Jews say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, said to her Woman, believe me, the hour is coming and is now here when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, for you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, is now, now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Then the woman said to Him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will teach us all these things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Living water, living water, that's who, who the Lord, what the Lord's going to give you. If you go down to verse 1, back to verse 1, it says the Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had baptized, made more disciples than John, 
and he baptized. Though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did. See, Jesus never baptized with water. He never baptized with water. His disciples did. Can you imagine if, if Jesus baptized someone in water and he didn't baptize other people in water? Some people would kind of look at those people as being kind of special. But the Lord doesn't want to have your, have your focus on other people. He wants your focus to be on him. But the Lord himself, the Lord himself was baptized. And he did that as, a, as, a, as an example to you. That once you come to Christ, you to be baptized. If you go over the, the Gospel of Matthew, the first of the Gospels, Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, Matthew 3, 13, says this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Now are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. See, baptism is a righteous act. And when you come to Christ, he tells you, you know, you should be baptized. You should be baptized just like he was. He's your, he's your chief example to fulfill all righteousness. Now Jesus, he baptized, he didn't baptize with water, but he baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he told men to repent, to turn to God. That's the type of baptism he baptizes with. If you go down to verse 3, he says, He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. See, Jesus needed to go through Samaria. There was something he had to do there. He had a, a certain woman that he needed to talk to. I remember when I was a lot younger, me and my brother one day, we went fishing in the morning. And we were, we kind of quit about noon. I mean, I was pretty tired. So when I got home, I, I was pretty tired and I figured, well, I'm not going to do nothing today, but just kind of lie around, maybe watch a ball game. So I turned the TV on to see if the ball game was on. And when I, when I turned the TV on, there was this commercial that was on. And it was a beer commercial. And there was this woman, she was dancing around, having a good time with this guy. And they panned up on the, the face of this woman. And she looked an awful lot like, like a girl that I had dated a few years earlier. And I got kind of jealous, you know. And I clicked the TV off. And I said, you know, Lord, I don't care if I ever see her again, but I sure hope that, he, that she's saved. And the ball game wasn't on, so I figured I'd go out. I was painting the house at the time, so I figured I'd go out and paint the house. So I went upstairs and got some new clothes on, or old clothes on, I should say. And then I got my, my paint bucket and I went outside, and I opened it up, and I stirred up the paint. And I, I poured it in my, my little paint bucket I was using. And I climbed up on my scaffolding. I got kind of a two-story house, so I climbed up about three, three levels on the scaffolding. And I was at the highest part there. And I just started taking out my roller to paint the house. Then I heard a voice down below saying to me, Hey, you missed a spot. And I looked down, and there was this girl that I hadn't seen for, for a couple of years, my ex-girlfriend. 
I at the time I didn't I didn't put two and two together what had just happened there. But I, I came down from the scaffolding and I, I began talking to her. And she asked me one of the questions she asked me was, What was I doing? And I said, Well, I've been I've been studying the Bible lately. And she said to me, Well, you know, that's just just words from men, you know. And I said, No. No, that's the words of God. Men inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's the word of God. And that kind of took her aback a little bit. So we talked for about an hour and she left. And I kind of resumed painting the house. I had painted the house for another about three hours. And I was pretty tired and I, I finished and I, I remember just kind of trying to relax and I began to sit down on the couch kind of going through all the things that happened today and then it hit me all of a sudden what it had what what just had happened I just realized see by the time I said you know Lord I just hope that she's saved until the time that I that I saw her couldn't have been more than five to ten minutes And I was like, wow, wow. Well, anyhow, we began dating a little bit. And one, on one of those dates, I told her, I said, you know, I got something to tell you, and you're not going to believe this. Then I, I, I recounted that same story to her. And I said, you know, I think the Lord's trying to tell you something. I think he's trying to talk to you. Well, anyhow, she said she went home. She began reading her Bible. And later on, she told me that she read through her entire, entire Bible within about a week or two. See, the Lord was talking to her. I mean, I, I couldn't go through the Bible in a week or two. It takes me about 10 years to get through the entire Bible the way I read. Ah, but the Lord was talking to her. And in this story here, the Lord needs to talk to a Samaritan woman. He needs to talk to somebody. Back in verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, which is near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Je and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat down by the well, for it was about the sixth hour. See, this was a famous place in history. Jacob's well was there. Jacob was one of the ancestors of all Israel. So this was a special place that Jesus was at. Basically, the founding fathers of all the Jews, of all Israel, In verse 7, it says, A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then a woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now who were the Samaritans? Well, during the time of Isaiah the prophet, there was an empire that existed called the Assyrian Empire. And they were pretty powerful. And they were really very, a very mean empire. They're very violent, very violent people. And anyhow, they would attack other, other nations and they would take people captives and they'd bring them back to their land. Well, the Assyrians they went in and attacked the northern parts of Israel, Samaria. And what they did was once they controlled the land of Samaria, they started bringing these other people, these other captives that they, that they captured from other nations. And they began settling them into the land of Samaria. And what happened was that 
some of the Jews that were there, they intermarried with the, with the people of the foreign nations. That was something God said not, not to do. See, God told the, the nation of Israel, don't be marrying wives from foreign nations. The reason being, the Lord didn't want them to start, start to follow the, the gods, of their, their foreign gods, the non-gods, the false gods that they, that they worshipped. But the, these Jews that were in Samaria, they, they began to intermarry. So the rest of Israel throughout their history looked down upon the Samaritans because they disobeyed God. So they kind of looked at, as, at the Samaritans like they, they, they were some type of half-breed or something. So that's why the Jews didn't have any dealings with the Samaritans. They held a grudge against them for what they did. And the other thing was, it says, Jesus was talking to a woman. And at that time, if you're a man, you just didn't go up to any woman and start talking to her. Let me see. See, the woman at that time, during the time of Jesus, it's kind of like some of these Arab nations today, where they, they treat their, their women like they're second-class citizens or something. They won't let them to be, they won't allow them to be educated. But Jesus, he's going to talk to this woman. He cares about her. And he's got something to say to her. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him for a drink, and he would have given you living water. See, in this passage it says, The gift of God. See, Jesus is going to give people a gift. A gift is, is something that uh, is unconditional. There's no strings attached. It's not like when you, when you tell your kids, you know, hey, you know, you, you better be good or, or Santa Claus ain't going to get you nothing for Christmas. Well, then you know, you know well, just as well, that your kids ain't going to be good. They're not going to be good, but you're going to get them a present anyhow because you've got an unconditional love for them. And that's the way it is. It's a gift. And the other thing was, the Lord says, hey, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink. See, she didn't realize who Jesus was. And that's the way it is with a lot of people today. Oh, they, they might think Jesus is a, was a good good man, a nice philosopher, or maybe they got him pictured as a little baby in a manger, a sweet little baby, but they truly don't know who he is. I remember when I was listening, when I first come to know the Lord, I began listening to a, a Bible preacher, and the first time I heard a Bible preacher, he said, he said, you know, Jesus Christ, He's God in human flesh. And I said to myself, no, no, no. Jesus isn't God. But then he began speaking from all the passages of the Bible that show you that Jesus was God. Uh, then, I be real, then I realized who Jesus really, really was, who he was. She didn't know. The Samaritan woman, she didn't know at this time who he was. In verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is very deep. Where then will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well, and who drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his, and his livestock? Ah, Jacob's well. See, the woman... She was kind of relying on something in history. See, Jacob. Jacob. 
Jacob was a famous person to, to anybody in Israel. He brought up Jacob's name. They, they knew who you're talking about. She, she was asking Jesus, hey, are you greater than Jacob? Are you greater than Jacob? It would be kind of like saying, hey, hey, Jesus, you, you know who lived there? George Washington lived here. Ah. She, she was kind of focusing on that. But, you know, Jesus, he said, hey, you, you know what? You're not a child of God because you got somebody as one of your ancestors as a, as a famous person. You're not a child of God be, because of that. Uh, you, you better be worshiping him if you want to be a child of God. You see, Jesus, Jesus was actually greater than, than Jacob. As we just said, Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. See, Jacob, believe it or not, he met Jesus. He wrestled with him. And you're saying, how can that be? Ah, you go back to the book of Genesis, and I'll show you. The book of Genesis chapter 32. The very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 32, beginning at verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man, even if you look in your Bible, the man, M there is capitalized, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was, was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you, you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Gen then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me what is your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask me about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. See, Jacob wrestled with the God-man. He saw him face to face. And there's only one God-man. His name is Christ Jesus. He had his beginning at the very beginning of time. He was there at the creation of the world. And Jacob, Jacob wrestled with him. So here, she asked Jesus a question, are you greater than Jacob? <laughs> oh yeah, he was. Jesus is greater than Jacob. You go to verse 13. And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of the water of this well will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. You know, I remember when I was young in grade school, we used to study about the, the explorers of America. And one of the guys we learned about was a guy by the name of Ponce de Leon. He was a Spanish explorer, and he was one of the first ones to to go down to Florida. And actually he named Florida. But one thing that we were taught was that he was looking for the fountain of youth down there. See, he was wanting to find something that he could drink physically that would keep him alive forever physically. But hey, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to give you some water. It's going to be spiritual. And you're going to have a fountain inside of you springing up to everlasting life. That's the type of water Jesus is going to give you. 
is going to give you the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And when you die physically, I ain't never going to die spiritually ever. Give me life forever with the Lord. Give me life, life forever with Him. He's going to raise your body. Ah, uh, you're going to live forever with the Lord Christ if you put your faith in Him. In verse 15, he said, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I, I may not thirst and never ha have to come here to draw water again. And Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. And then the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have said well for you, that you have no husband. For you have had but five husbands, and the one who you are now living with is not your husband. And that you spoke truly. And that you spoke truly. You see, Jesus... Here, he, he's, he's confronting her with her sin problem. See, she was, she's been, she was married five times. And we, we don't know the reason why she was married five times. Whether all five of her husbands died. Maybe she, maybe she was divorced. But we know one thing here. She was living outside of marriage and sin with someone. And in this culture, this culture kind of glorifies that. You watch it in the movies, you see people having sex sites outside of marriage all the time. But you know, the Lord says, hey, you know, if, you're mar if you have sex outside of marriage with someone, with anyone, well, according to Him, in His eyes, you're married then. For example, if you go back to the book of Exodus, book of Exodus chapter 22. And beginning at verse 16. It says this, If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife to be his wife you see when you're running around with every Tom, Dick and Harry out there you better understand something don't be doing that you need to be true to the one to draw the one you're with because the Lord says hey if you have sex outside of marriage in his eyes you're married so you really ought to do the right thing and go out and get married legally that's what the Lord says. But see, hey, this woman here, she was living outside of, outside of marriage and sin. And Jesus confronts her with that. See, Jesus confronted people with their sin. So the first thing that she does is she kind of, she tries to change the subject here. She doesn't want to really talk about this subject, but the guy that she's living with. And she says in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain. But you Jews say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. See, she knew that there was something different about Jesus because, you know, Jesus was, was telling her something that probably nobody else really knew about her life. So you can't pull a pull a wool over Jesus' eyes. He knows you. He knows what you're doing. He knows your heart. But there was something different about Jesus. See, she knew that it seemed to be to her that he was a prophet. He was a prophet. He's a prophet. The one that the, the prophet that the one that all the prophets in the Old Testament spoke about not just a regular prophet Jesus wasn't he was a prophet of all prophets that's who Jesus was 
You know, the Islamics believe that Muhammad was uh, the last prophet. <laughs> Muhammad was no prophet whatsoever. The last prophet that there ever was, never will be, is Jesus Christ. He's the one. He's the one you want to hear. Hear his words. And then in verse, verse 20, she starts talking about the place where you worship. See, she thought that because she was in a special place where Jacob was, and he, there, was this, there was this high mountain that was right next to, to where they lived, and that's where they all believed that Jacob went up and he worshipped on. That's what they believed anyhow. But she said, hey, you know, you Jews say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Which was true. I mean, that's where, that's where God had built the temple. And he told the people to come and, and offer them sacrifices there. But see, the Samaritans, they, they, didn't, they didn't buy into that. See, they were worshiping God falsely. They didn't know the truth about how to worship God. They didn't know the truth about it. And that's the way it is with a lot of people. They think that somehow that worship is in a place. It's in a particular church or some place within a church. That's where you worship God. But Jesus is going to tell her something different. He said, hey, the place ain't important, sister. The place is not important. I need you to worship me and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. That's what you got to do. And Jesus said to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. That's not where you're going to worship the Father. It's not where you're going to worship the Father. Then he goes on and says, You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. See, the Samaritans really didn't understand God fully. See, the Samaritans only believed in the first five books of the Bible. So they, did, they didn't believe in all the other books of the Bible, all the prophets that that talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus. So they missed out on all these messianic passages that would tell you more about the Messiah. It's kind of like uh, today, it'd be kind of like the Mormons. See, the Mormons, they, they believe in a lot of the Bible, but they have their special book called the Book of Mormon. And so they have a, a false view of who Jesus, who the Messiah, really is. And that's the way it is with the Samaritans. They, they didn't know, this, this woman didn't, didn't know a lot about the Messiah. And then the Lord says, hey, salvation is from the Jews. You see, if, she, if they would have known the Old Testament prophets, they would have known that the Messiah was going to come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through King David's seed. But see, see they, never, they never really took King David as being somebody special. But the prophets all said that there would be a son of David, a seed of David that would come. And Jesus was, a, was that seed of David. In verse 23 says, But the hour is coming and is now here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. For God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. See, worship doesn't happen, like I said, in the outside, in some church. It happens on the inside. I remember going to a few churches and uh, 
some of the pastors would talk about, hey, you need to come up to the altar to worship God, to pray to God. Well, let's understand something here, what the altar is. See, the altar in the Old Testament was a place where the Jews, they would bring their, their sacrifices, their animal sacrifices. And they would, they would take a lamb, for example, and they'd, they'd put it on the altar, and they'd kill it. And then they'd, they'd burn that lamb. Now the Jews would bring it there as a sin offering to God so that their sins would be forgiven. That's what the altar was all, all about. Ah, you, you better understand something. When Jesus died, he was the lamb that was sacrificed on the final altar. That's who the Lord was. That altar was a cross. Don't be telling people they got to go up to some altar to see God, to pray to God. The altar isn't in a building. It's not in a building. It's in Christ. He's the one who died for you. He was the final sacrifice, the final sin offering. Don't be talking about altars like they're, it's a some, some place like, like the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus is telling you right here, hey, that's not where you're going to find the Lord. You need to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. You want to know a little bit about the altar? Go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. There ain't no altars today except for Christ. Hebrews 13. It talks about a little bit about the altar. Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 9, beginning at verse 10, I'm sorry. It says, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. He suffered outside the gate. See, he was the altar. He's the one who, who bore your sin, bore your reproach. He's the one he's pointing to. He's the altar. He's the one who was sacrificed on that altar, and that final, he was the final sin offering. So I'm going to be telling people that they need to go to some special spot to pray to God. Uh, they can do it within their heart. Back in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 25. Then the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called a Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all these things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, it is he. Huh? He was the Messiah. The Messiah means the Christ, the anointed one. See, the Lord, he was there. She was wanting the Messiah to come to teach, teach her all these things. And she was talking to him. See, Jesus told her that, that he was the one. He was the one that she was looking for. If you want to learn the, the ways of God, you need to hear the words of Jesus. And you're going to find them here in this book, the Bible. It's the only place you're going to find them. See, this Samaritan woman, she was thirsty for the words of God. She was thirsty for the words of God. And only Jesus can quench that spiritual thirst. It's like that cold glass of water, cold glass of ice water that you drink on a hot day. It quenches your thirst. But that, that, that's only going to quench your thirst for a temporary time. But when Jesus, you come to Jesus, he's going to 
He's going to quench that spiritual thirst you got. That spiritual thir thirst you got for God. And he's going to quench it. And he's going to give you his spirit within you. And that spirit is going to be like a fountain inside of you, springing up to everlasting life. You won't be thirsting for God no more. You'll know the truth. So you need to come to Jesus, hear his words. If you want to be, if you want to have your, your thirst quenched, come to the Lord Jesus. He's the fountain. He's the water. He'll quench your thirst.